I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay. Today, we are talking about Pride and Prejudice, the 2005 film directed by Joe Wright, screenplay by Deborah Magak, based on the novel by Jane Austen. I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, Mr. Tucker. And Alex <laughs> Cayeros. Hi. We're talking about Pride and Prejudice because I had not seen this film, and when I said that aloud, everyone else on the team (laughs) said, what are you doing not having seen this film? Uh, And so we decided to do a podcast about it because that's probably the best way to force me to watch a thing. Uh, (laughs) And it worked. So I've now seen Pride and Prejudice. And uh, yeah, it was definitely I remember seeing it on posters a lot. Like it was a film that I felt like it it was kind of remarkable that I hadn't seen because I saw a lot of Mm -hmm. movies at that time. So yeah, so it was interesting going and seeing that. I think it's also my first Jane Austen exposure of any kind. Wow. Which we can talk about. Yeah, because I don't think I was ever like in school. I don't think we ever had to read any of her books. And generally speaking, I don't read a book unless I'm forced to. So, (laughs) but yeah, we can talk about all that. Wow. But learning more about it and her has been really interesting. So yeah, so Mission Accomplished, I've seen it. I'm curious for you guys, uh, when did you guys see it and what was your experience around it? Brian, what about you? When did you see it? Uh, I saw it when it came out. Um, I don't remember uh, the circumstances. I know I saw it by myself. Um, I think it was one of the first years I was paying attention to all the Oscar movies because like Mm -hmm. looking up the Oscars that year, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember seeing all those movies around the same time. Um, And uh, and yeah, I loved it. And uh, always the, the scene that I remember the most is. Donald Sutherland saying, you know, your mother will never speak to you if, if you mm-hmm. if you don't marry him and I'll never speak to you if you will. And I just remember that that moment being like, oh, good. She has an ally. And Donald <laughs> Sutherland is yeah. adorable and amazing. And uh, yeah, so I remember the movie very fondly, but have not watched it in 15 years. So it was great to revisit it. Nice. Yeah, I saw it when it came out in theaters and I really enjoyed it. I, I remember not really yeah, knowing much about the actual story or I, I don't think I had read a Jane Austen book. <laughs> And I was really surprised by the filmmaking. You know, I, I went mm-hmm. in not really expecting anything special. And you know, this was Joe Wright's first uh, film Which he directed. Which is crazy. Yeah. It's, it's first film. That's so crazy. gorgeous. Yeah. Right. And I remember just one of the first shots of the movie is, is like floating through the house. I was like, wait a minute. Is this a one like a long take? What's, yep. what's happening? This is not a movie with long takes, is it? And uh, realizing throughout the film of like what interesting filmmaking was happening. Um mm-hmm. So I, I liked it more than I expected, and uh, and I also loved the soundtrack. It became kind of so like my beautiful. default, like homework music. Like I think it was, mm-hmm. it was my first year of college. I think so. It was like definitely like on repeat soundtrack constantly. So I, I feel like I know the soundtrack better than the film. Ultimately, <laughs> it's just like I, I've listened to it more than I've seen the movie. Quick question, because this happens to me with video games. Like if you know the soundtrack better than the movie, do you then watch the movie and sort of like? have nostalgia for like the soundtrack in a weird way like you hear, do you <laughs> yeah. hear certain score moments and be like oh i love this mo like I, I have more of a connection with this moment than i do with this scene in the movie necessarily absolutely yeah i had yeah. that experience watching it again i'm like oh yeah this track <laughs> <laughs> interesting yeah what about you trisha um so i saw this when it came out and at the time i wasn't I was about to say that I wasn't like a big fan of of drawing room dramas or like the Regency, like romantic drama kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But that's absolutely not true, actually, because in the 90s, um, they were making a bunch of these like they made the, the Gwyneth Paltrow version of Emma um, and the BBC version of Pride and Prejudice was a really big deal. And then they made the, the Sense and Sensibility adaptation with mm-hmm. Emma Thompson, which is, you know, excellent. Um, and so. They were making these, and I did watch all of those at the time, but I wouldn't have said that that was my favorite genre of film or anything like that. Um, Mm -hmm. I took a class on the British romantics in college, and I, full disclosure, did not love it at all. (laughs) Like, I didn't love that class or the British romantics. Um, (laughs) But this was right around the time that I uh, would have been taking that class, and it it just really impressed me for the filmmaking, which you're talking about, Alex. But also, it is a totally different approach to this kind of, um, it's actually, you know, sort of what's known in British cinema as like a heritage film, which is kind of a loaded term 
anyway. And <laughs> Sounds we kind of like, racist. <laughs> it, well, and that's the criticism of this kind of movie, right? Right. Because this style of film is always about upper class, like sort of mm-hmm. worries and issues and everybody's white and like yeah. there's no poor people anywhere. Um, <laughs> you know, but and, and that's and that is a critique. The other side of the coin, of course, is that these stories are almost always about women who are kind of bucking trends and expectations in the time that they're in. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of, there's like a deep dive that we could do down into like (laughs) British film criticism and theory on heritage movies, but we'll, we'll try to keep this, but this is just approached stylistically in a very different way than a lot of those others. So like, if you stand this next to something like the 1995 or 1996 Emma or Sense and Sensibility, it -hmm. just looks completely different. Right. It actually is. It feels like modern filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely the first thing I was struck by also. It's just how exactly that the modern filmmaking feel and also had that reaction that you were describing Alex of like is this a long take yeah this is a long take this is kind Mm -hmm. of fun as it's like going through the party and stuff Mm -hmm. and I think that was uh yeah the 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 first top level thing that I was impressed by is that there are scenes that again could be like fine on their own if shot in a traditional way right but the commitment to doing it just a little differently uh really amplified the the sensation of it and I, I feel like the one i liked the most was when kira knightley's dancing with mr darcy and it's yes. all like the one long shot and it's kind of zoomed and it's following them and going like, yeah but it follows one over this way and then back that way and you kind of feel like you're dancing with them i feel like that was all just really it, it, it added that extra layer which is fun to have in a scene like that and in, and in yeah. that same scene the uh mr collins trying to like uh-huh. have a conversation with her but like, oh, yeah, right. constantly being cut off because of the dance moves it's so brilliant <laughs> <or, like, laughs> yeah yeah I, I yeah i think um it's interesting because there was definitely a a decade for around the the aughts where there was a the, little bit of the style of let's make a period piece but in a cool modern way and mm-hmm. like the prestige i think did it really well yeah exactly um mm-hmm. and yeah. then you have something like plunkett and mclean which not everyone has seen um <laughs> it's by uh by jake scott one of the scott's uh sons mm-hmm. and uh it's it's half of the cast of train spotting um it's uh, robert carlisle and johnny lee miller and they're like oh. highwaymen uh in you know in the restaurant period and Liv Tyler's there and Alan Cumming is amazing and interesting but but it sort of takes this like almost like a Quentin Tarantino Django Unchained approach of we're not even going to try to pretend that we are we're not going to get you to pretend that you are in this time period we're going to do sort of total stylistic modern filmmaking right and for better or for worse obviously and I think that 95% 95% of Pride and Prejudice works for me. And I think the only thing that has not aged well is the sort of handheld zoom like shots and that kind of thing mm. where it sort of feels like you have this very like the natural lighting, the cinematography is so beautiful and the production yeah. design. And I think those long takes really help feel you immersed in the world. But then suddenly it feels like I'm watching The Office where like someone says something and then like the camera quickly zooms on someone <laughs> to get the reaction <laughs> and, and things like that. So those are the little things where I'm like, yeah, that wouldn't like Joe Wright would not be doing that in 2020. Like, right. uh, but it was kind yeah. of a little more of the style of the time. And it's one of those things that you, that just stood out to me as, okay, this is maybe where the, the filmmaking and the, there's sort of a, a dissonance between the filmmaking and the subject matter and the world. But again, that's 5% of the otherwise in my mind, 90 95% like fantastic filmmaking. Yeah. It's really interesting that, around this time and maybe this is what you're talking about Bri because it is it wasn't just happening in period films but it seemed like directors were able and and very in fact invested in entering the conversation about why we make movies the way that we do sure um and so actually the movie that I'm thinking about right now that we've talked about with this before is Casino Royale mm. where it's just a complete which was right around this like this exact time, basically, you know, in the early aughts, uh, there's this, you know, shift, great shift toward realism and, you know, sort of overall like a darker or messier look at, at all kinds of genres. And we see that in action with something like Casino Royale, where you're sort of stripping away the veneer of like all the James Bond, like shiny, slick, gadgety kind of things. But we also see this in our 
period films and even like well they definitely stopped making rom-coms but of course like in sci-fi we've talked about before on the show Mm -hmm. they were doing that as well so it's something like war of the worlds um which we talked about with Lindsay ellis so i i think it was really a conscious choice for a lot of these directors to wade into this why do we shoot movies the way that we do and is that always serving the story and serving the audience the best way that it could be. Right. Yeah. And having memories of walking into the theater that I would always go to see movies at when I was, you know, in middle school Mm -hmm. and with my group of friends, a lot of which were uh, girls. And so we were kind of seeing movies that I probably wouldn't have seen on my own because it was like, there's no explosions. I only care about that. I'm 14. (laughs) Uh, But like, yeah, I was just looking at like a knight's tale is something that's like totally like remixing things. And even like Romeo plus Juliet by Baz Luhrmann and Moulin Rouge. Like there was this kind of weird mini era where it's like, let's just remix all the things. (laughs) Right. Uh, And that's kind of fun. And it's interesting. I wonder if that kind of then bled over to the more prestige, you know, filmmakers and kind of Mm. influenced the trajectory of filmmaking in that way. Because I feel like there was also this like the shift of like the indie film style, I feel like started to bleed over, especially with like, like Christopher Nolan being chosen to do Batman Begins coming Mm -hmm. from Memento and like John Favreau doing Iron Man. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, there is this kind of interesting shift happening in this period that I hadn't really clocked before. Yeah. And if you're not well acquainted with this kind of movie or especially like the nineties incarnations of it, it might not be easy to see the ways that it comes out in pride and prejudice, but it's, it's definitely there. There actually is just in terms of like what feels modern about it. It's actually there very much in um, just the way that this entire thing was approached. So for example, the, the adaptations of this novel are typically set in the, classic like high regency era which has a totally different look than so like this book was published in 1813 um which was like sort of the classic english regency kind of thing where you you would see like the empire waist dresses you know and very just opulence kind of i liked that regency is also defined by the period where king george was going crazy <laughs> <laughs> Is the thing that I learned today. Anyway, that's just, <laughs> yep. there was an unsettlement because the king was going crazy. Anyway, Correct. continue. Joe Wright and uh, Deborah Maga did very uniquely. They approached this as like a much a, an earlier, like sort of less clean and polished time. And they actually downgraded the Bennetts in terms of like how much money that they had. Mm. I mean- they definitely would not have had money. And that is sort of like the crux of the plot to begin with, which is that the Bennett's are disadvantaged, but they're still among society. They're still landowners, that kind of thing. But just, yeah, all the mud, like thinking about all those barnyard scenes and like, you know, the the daughter's out walking in the rain and like, can you, she borrow the carriage? No, she can't. She's just going to walk over there. Like that's all, it, it has a much more grounded feeling to it. That's part of my experience when I first watched it as well, was I was expecting the more, the 90s, like, polished, mm-hmm. everything's really clean and prim and proper version of this kind of story. And I was, it was really gratifying, actually, to have, like, a dirty world, you know, where, yeah. like, things <laughs> right. get muddy, things get muddy, people don't always look perfect, like, their clothes are a little bit rumpled, like, it, it feels like a lived-in universe and not this Hollywood clean pristine version of you know high society which i think is reflected in the filmmaking yeah i i I agree i think i like that it sort of it plays with the expectations you have of this world where everybody is talking in this very mama papa you know kind of way that you would expect and i'm sure a lot of the dialogue is taken straight from the book and that's why it is you know like they didn't want to just completely change that dialogue but then you have these these little moments of like you were saying Collins trying to dance and have a conversation at the same time and it's almost like the character and the filmmakers saying we know this is a little silly let's have fun with the fact that it's a little silly or the yes. butler or valet coming in and having to announce Mrs. Bennett Miss Bennett Miss Bennett Miss Bennett and Miss Bennett <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah and um and I think that there are those those little moments of saying this is the time period and we are being serious with it but at the same time we are going to have a little fun with it especially since the entire theme of the movie is our protagonist 
shirking those um, those mores of, of the time, you know? Yeah, there's a thing in in the examples of earlier examples of the genre that I mentioned already where no one talks over each other. Everyone just sort of like stands stiffly and waits for somebody to finish speaking. And then the next mm-hmm. person goes ahead and speaks. And the scene you're talking about with Collins at the ball where like he's talking, we're hearing different conversations at once. We're like hearing the music loud in the mix. We're hearing people's footsteps like stomping up and down Um, and thinking about the scenes, especially the scenes in the Bennett's house where the girls are running around like giggling and like Mary's banging on the piano. Uh (laughs) It's a deconstruction of a lot of that the stiffness that I think people at this point really just weren't interested in, in right. a, a period film. It's a really funny movie too. Like, yeah, I, you really know, and funny. <laughs> Tom Hollander. <laughs> yeah. Collins is amazing. Yeah. Like, like all of his scenes, I'm just so happy right. when he's on screen. <laughs> the yeah. worst right. haircut they ever could have put on him or anybody. <laughs> God well, he, bless. He, he just commits to that role so hard. He's like, amazing. He just, I think he steals every scene he's in because oh, yeah. he's yeah. so embodying this, th- that guy, you know? <laughs> the, the scene where he walks up behind Darcy and Darcy <laughs> is like not paying attention to him. And it looks like, I don't know, it seems like Matthew McFadden is like two feet taller than Tom Well, I think <laughs> you can also tell when, when Collins is about to, is trying to dance that they just, specifically cast like six foot two tall men to be around him. So he's just completely (laughs) dwarfed by them. It's also weird watching this, having just talked about pirates. Mm -hmm. It was weird to be like, Admiral Beckett, what are you doing here? And get away from Elizabeth Swan. Anyway. (laughs) Well, if if we could talk about Kira Knightley playing a woman named Elizabeth who doesn't really like the world that she's in and is tr- and is supposed right. to marry this guy who she's not that interested in and is trying to like shirk the the culture and everything. I'm like, yeah, it's it's pretty much she's kind of typecast. There's there's this uh, show called How Not to Live Your Life. It's a British uh, sitcom from from about a decade ago. The main character he talks through voiceover so he's talking to the audience and he ends up i think dating a woman who's very well to do and he goes to her parents estate and it's this like huge like downton abbey type thing and he says oh her parents estate was amazing it was like something out of a kira knightley novel (laughs) (laughs) that's great that's pretty great. Well, and even Mr. Wickham, when he showed up, I was mm-hmm. like, Orlando Bloom? No, he no, clearly not is. Orlando Bloom, but yeah. like yeah. clearly su- yeah, it's like supposed to Orlando be Orlando Bloom, Bloom stand in. Like, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> but the only other line I was going to say that I just, I mean, there's so many really funny moments in this movie, but the line that one of the lines that made me just laugh out loud was Judy Dench so seriously and so sternly saying, if I had studied piano, I would have been a great proficient. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's like is so sure that she would be amazing at piano if she had actually bothered to learn <laughs> right and this reminds me brian of something that you said earlier that i was going to comment on which is that so a lot of the dialogue in deborah Magach's original script was taken straight out of the book like when mm-hmm. she first started working on adapting this because she is a novelist i mean she's also a wonderful screenwriter um, mm-hmm. but, but primarily what she does is adapt novels in like especially classic novels into like screenplays. And so she was wanted to be really faithful. And for the record, Pride and Prejudice to many readers, I was going to say British readers, but also many American readers is like sacred. It's something that as, as the, the novel itself is like widely studied, it's widely read even today. And so there's, it's a property that comes loaded with like expectation if you're going to approach it as an adaptation. And so um, Joe Wright, but uh, even before he came on board, Deborah Magach was um, really trying to stay faithful to it. And then as they got into this idea of, well, let's actually blend it with a little bit more modernism, a little bit more realism. Um, Let's change the time period that it's typically set in. You know, so I think they said that this adaptation is technically set in like 1790, somewhere around there, as opposed to 1813, which is when it's normally like the 18 teens when it's normally set. Hmm. There is actually a decent amount of like modern sentence construction in the dialogue, even if it still feels like a little difficult to our ears, right. believe me when I tell you, it is easier than <laughs> than like reading the dialogue straight out of the novel. Um, and I think what that does is actually bring out the humor because the novel is really funny, but it's like difficult to access the humor when you're just sort of like 
fighting upstream through the language. (laughs) And so actually taking a little bit of a more modern approach to the language brings out the intent and the wit that Jane Austen already had written into the novel. It actually reminds me of a movie that I think Brian didn't like very much, but I loved from last year, uh, The King on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And one thing I really liked about that film was that they they were adapting kind of Shakespearean language Mm -hmm. with a modern twist. So it was it was kind of giving me the best of both worlds where I kind of got Mm. a really modern feeling film, but it it carried with it a lot of the weight and the just the poetry of the more kind of Shakespearean dialogue. Uh, So I I really like when that can be accomplished. And Pride and Prejudice does it for me as well, where it's like I'm getting the humor. I'm with the characters. I understand the story. But there's also a poetry to it. And and the wit is almost, you know, enhanced because it's being delivered in such an exquisite way. Yes. Uh, so I, 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 I would like to see more films like this where they do that hybrid kind of mashup of the language. I really like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that it's always an interesting choice how true the a filmmaker will stay to well, what exactly did they sound like during that time? Right. Or what, how do we want to present it? You know, something like Little Women, which um, the, the recent one, which was made in a very modern way, but also it's an American novel from 50 years yep. later than Pride and Prejudice. So it, it's a little easier to, to sort of take on or a, a movie where the Russians speak in British accents because it's just easier <laughs> to do it that way. We don't make the whole, you know, but then Hunter right. at October is like, we're going to show you that we are making this choice by zooming in and zooming out. But uh, yeah, I think like Lord of the Rings is a good example of something that, you know, no one's saying doth or anything like that. It's just like right. they are speaking in this way that is heightened and feels sort of like it has this old English pitch to it but at the same time they're not saying words that are completely or or like sentence structure or anything that are completely strange to our ears so we can sort of like you were saying alex it's kind of this nice hybrid of we want to be true to to the time period or the source material or whatever it is but we also don't want to uh alienate you you know if you're adapting shakespeare Shakespeare is written in iambic pentameter. So you are either using it or you're not, and you make that choice. But when you're adapting almost anything else, then you have to sort of find that balance between the two. Well, and and the example of somebody who commits 100% to veracity with no need, like feeling no uh, obligation (laughs) to translate is Robert Eggers with uh, The the Witch and The Lighthouse, both of which... um, like I don't even know most of what was spoken in the witch. I have to rewatch it like with subtitles on because the first time I saw yeah. it in theaters, I was like, I don't know what is being said here. It sounds really cool because it's like literally like the journal entries from like pilgrims. Right. But like the way they're like constructing their sentences and speaking is like almost a foreign language. Um, so that's an interesting choice to make if you want to just be like, we're going to immerse you 100 percent almost as an experiment. Uh, but you're going to alienate a lot of people that way. And I do think that, so what we're talking about is you essentially have to kind of invent your own version of a historical language. Mm -hmm. I mean, in something like Lord of the Rings, it truly is fantasy. So you really can just invent the language out of anything, (laughs) but it's still English, right? So it's like, you still are going to pick an era of English essentially and use it. So I ran into something very similar to this a few years ago. I wrote a play that was set in 325 AD in the Roman Empire. Don't ask why. It's a long thing. But the point is, obviously, I was just a good, I had to invent a language because anything from that time was written in ancient Greek and the earliest translations of it weren't made for hundreds of years. So I basically had to like pick and I, I ended up picking like an 1800s sort of like construction for it. Um, I think that this version of Pride and Prejudice excels, but I do think there are moments at different ends of the spectrum where sometimes it feels really, like I can tell it's straight out of the book from 1813. Mm -hmm. And other times when I can tell it was written in 2005, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, Even though the the 2005 lines don't feel that terrible to me, I think to, to me the polarities are like, the 2005-est scene in it is the one where um, Elizabeth is talking back to the Dame Judi Dench character, mm-hmm. um, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, uh, at the dinner table. And she's saying things like, Get out, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> YOLO. 
I think that's actually a direct quote from, yeah. from the, that scene. Um, but she's talking about how her sisters are all grown up and she's like, yes, ma'am, they're all out in society. And it just, it doesn't, it doesn't really have the complexity that you get from the Jane Austen dialogue. And then the, the furthest other end of the spectrum to me is the one where Elizabeth and Caroline Bingley are walking around that room and Darcy is sitting at the desk mm -hmm. and just being like, what are your designs? If you wish me to observe your figures, I can see them much better from here. Like that's, that is straight out of the book and it feels that way. If you stood those two scenes in the same, like right next to each other, I think it would feel a bit more jarring, but because the movie is on this kind of spectrum, like always on a sliding place in there, it works. Same thing with like the, the different way, the degrees of politeness that we see witnessed from the characters too, as I was talking about earlier. Yeah. I think as like the, the sort of values in the movie get broken apart a little. So does the dialogue. And I'm not saying it's mm -hmm. like they thought this through really hard, but it does seem like the movie starts with a lot of this kind of heightened thing. And then as it goes a little more deep into it, then you get it sort of you get relaxed a little bit more in that and you start to feel more more modern sentences, more kind of a of a familiar feel. Definitely. Yeah, I, I really, I really like that drawing room scene uh, where they, you mm -hmm. know, well, you take like a, what did she say? Like a walk. A turn about the room. A turn about the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just because I feel like the movie does do that modern thing of drawing out the like kind of absurdity of all this. Yeah. And just like the slow, weird pace at which life is lived when you have nothing to do because you're just filthy rich. And, <laughs> Literally like, nothing to do. You're just lounging all the time. And so it's like. I'm going to refresh myself by walking in a circle now. And you know, I mean, <laughs> is that is that so hard to to, to identify with in 2020? <laughs> <laughs> right, but like without iPhones, without video games, like right. there's nothing you know that you can read or write or you know. I'll be right back, guys. I'm yeah. going to go take a turn about the room. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Like it's. I just think it's really, it's a fun scene in that in a slow, strange way because it's drawing out the strangeness of and Kira right, Knightley. Yeah. She never really looks straight into camera, of course. <laughs> but it, there are moments in this where she almost is like, like, uh -huh. like does a gym from the office. Like, is this really <laughs> happening now? Right. And that's one of the moments where Caroline is like, take a turn about the room with me. And she's like, uh-huh. Okay. That's <laughs> like, a normal, yeah. not absurd thing to do. Sure. Right. That was one of the first um, moments where I thought, is this movie just really drilling hard on on sort of these are this is how the world was or is it sort of playing with little and then i think it's immediately followed by mrs bennett miss bennett miss bennett you know where you <laughs> see like the look on his face he's like i have to address things this way like this is my life you know <laughs> and i think okay cool like we are in sort of playful territory even though we are we are not making fun of this world necessarily but we are playing with the the rules kelly riley as as caroline also yeah. was mm -hmm. like wonderful she's wonderful just exactly <laughs> the person that you want to hate like just right just, deliciously so just her facial expressions are just they just do so much <laughs> right mm -hmm. yeah i i think that i was i think surprised by um because of my ignorance about jane austen uh was this wit that we're talking about mm -hmm. where going into it you know I, I really didn't know exactly what to expect like a, you know a romance from british people times being british -y stuff right <laughs> like it's it's kind of the vague idea uh -huh. i had in my head wow and and watching it i realized i'd, I'd seen parts of it before because again a lot of my friends especially in high school uh were very into it and were and had very strong opinions about colin firth mr darcy mm -hmm. versus matthew mcfadden mr darcy like, oh right that was like a big thing wasn't it yeah jane austen fans are serious man I don't mess with them. They have like, a lot of thoughts. Really intense debates about the Darcys. Oh, yeah. Right. right. <laughs> and watching this, I was like, I came around to Matthew McFadden, but I got why people were like, no, Colin Firth. I was like, yeah, I mean, I feel like I want Colin Firth right now. <laughs> like, I feel like I always want Colin Firth, though. So Sure. I mean, yeah, we all do. Colin Firth is so Mr. Darcy. He played Mr. Darcy in Bridget Jones' Diary also, <laughs> where <laughs> in the book she mentions like, oh, Mark Darcy, he looks kind of like Colin Firth. And then they made a movie and Colin Firth plays him. <laughs> he, he has been our Mr. Darcy for- He is the Darcyest you know. Darcy ever. But I really do. I really do love Matthew McFadden in this. Yeah, it's, it's funny now because he's now like the guy from Succession. So it was fun mm -hmm. to watch it like, mm -hmm. after seeing a very different character in Succession. Um, have you guys seen Succession? Anybody here? No. If not, yeah, he, Stop a, outing 
us on stuff we haven't seen <laughs> on the podcast. Listen, it's usually me or Michael, so it's nice when it's not us. <laughs> In Succession, he plays a really per- like particular character, so it's mm. interesting. It's interesting to see him like back like before he was known as that character. Anyway, but yeah, so again, I I had this this kind of vague expectation where like I associated Pride and Prejudice with people in high school arguing about Colin Firth or not kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And so I was like expecting like a well-made film about like a romance story. And even just like the framing of that is like loaded, obviously. Sure. But I think the I was uh, delighted by I turned on subtitles because I think that's just kind of the default when anything is super British for me, just to like make sure my bases are covered. And so I was <laughs> wow. surprised. Stay tuned for next week's episode. <laughs> oh. oh, God, God. is that British? Oh, oh, boy. All right. I cannot wait. <laughs> Turn on all the subtitles. Anyway, yeah. So it, it was this, along with the delight of seeing the filmmaking being this like level above, it was like, oh, the writing, the, the delight of the writing isn't so much even what's happening in the plot. It's like how it's being conveyed. And yeah. kind of in the research that I've done into Jane Austen in the last 24 hours, and I literally watched a crash course video about about oh, wow. the story because nice. I wanted to like understand the context more. And you know, they use uh, passages from the book, and it, it kind of all made it click for me in a way that I I don't think I appreciated or was really ever. I'm not gonna say I wasn't ever given the opportunity to appreciate because I could have just watched the movie or read the book, but I feel like it's. <laughs> It's not True. something that's that goes along with how these films are presented. And yeah. so it was really cool to learn about that and learn about her writing style and the wit and the sarcasm and the biting uh, uh-huh. phraseology that just like feels so modern. Like just the little bits I read, I was like, oh, my God, this person, like I want to be this person. So I feel like that was like one of the big takeaways for me. It's like understanding that there's like multiple layers happening here. Uh, and that like so much of the richness comes from the kind of commentary on society that's buried with those layers as well. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I mean, to have the protagonists of a rom-com, I'm going to call this a rom-com. Okay. Uh, why not? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Listen, every time it's adapted into the modern day, as Brian was pointing out, it's a rom-com. And, and most of these books are, I mean, Every adaptation of Emma is a rom-com, you know? Um, right. Anyway, so it's it's certainly a, a very old trope to have two central characters in a rom-com that really hate each other or just clash over their fundamental values. There's nothing that we love more in that dynamic than when they're on like equal verbal sparring mm-hmm. levels. Mm, yeah. Yes where they really can dish it back and forth and kind of like break through each other's facades. There's that, again, that wit and intelligence to that exchange of ideas. So I love it when um, Elizabeth is sitting at the piano after Catherine DeBerg has ordered her to play Mm -hmm. and Fitzwilliam comes over and he's like, Oh, what was my friend like it? You know, when he was in the countryside with you and she's like, do you really care to know? Prepare yourself for something truly terrible, you know? <laughs> and and um, Darcy is standing there and he can hear what she's saying. And then they get into this exchange of ideas. She's like, oh, no one can be introduced at a ball. He's like, I didn't know anybody. There's not a, a, like, none of us are that witty in real life where we can just dish it back that quickly, right? We always think of it so much later. Mm-hmm. But it has that heightened reality and that satisfaction when someone dishes it in a movie in the moment, um, and the longer it goes on, almost the more exciting it gets. And, and it creates that chemistry. I mean, Matthew McFadden and Keira Knightley have great chemistry anyway, but it's in the dialogue. Mm-hmm. It reminded me of Sorkin for that reason. Yeah. It's like people are smarter than they ever should be, right. but it, mm-hmm. it fits in this world and in the story in a way that Sorkin dialogue often doesn't in some of the stories that he writes. It made me really want to read the book because just the few passages I saw, I was like, every <laughs> like every half of the sentence has so much happening. And there was a quote that I came across that I think Jane Austen wrote in a letter that I just like loved that is, she said, I do not want people to be very agreeable as it saves me the trouble of liking them a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that, like, I just love that. that yeah. oh, I don't know. So that was a fun discovery for me. That's interesting. Yeah. 
one thing that it struck me watching the film again um, was that for yeah, for as modern as so much of what we're talking about feels, it was interesting about like some of the second half of the film for me that like didn't feel modern was the fact that kind of everybody, including Elizabeth, is distraught about certain improprieties that seem right. so silly now, but like in that context in that time are like absolutely devastating and absolutely like destroying of all mm-hmm. reputation and all everything. And so I think that's where it's almost like you can modernize certain aspects of a story like this, but then there are these like social norms and like, you know, the thing that is the problem things that needs to be solved, like is hard to resonate with, you know, for me where it's like, you know, the, the way that Darcy redeems himself is by like, paying off people to like uh-huh. make yeah. sure like the wedding is like uh, by being super rich yeah basically like, <laughs> basically. basically like paying yeah. off a lot of people <laughs> and like and basically like saving like reputation yeah like that like that is the and like and like and that and for elizabeth she's like likes she is kind of pushing against norms and breaking norms but ultimately that is the ultimate like beautiful thing you can do in this world is like throw your money around to like save reputations and like make things right in like the high society's eyes. So that, that was, that was where it was kind of funny to me. It was just like in this world, the romance is like achieved via this, like not modern, you know, path, you know, it's like, it's via reputation and money and agreements <laughs> and not right. the more modern romance idea of like, follow your heart, follow your feelings. It's like, he proved himself his true character through these acts, you know, which which are coming from a heartfelt place because they're for her and her family. Mm-hmm. But it, yeah, that was where it was. It was it was kind of making me like giggle a little bit. Like this is interesting how like as as modern as Elizabeth, Elizabeth is, the things she's ultimately concerned about and the, and the things that get resolved are don't feel modern at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. I would argue that her her feelings are her feelings, but her misunderstandings about his actions in the first two acts Mm -hmm. of the movie are what makes her not want to be with him. And it's not a necessarily so much about his actions. Like you were saying, I think it's more just about her understanding that he, his beliefs weren't what she thought and his prior actions were for different reasons than what she thought. That's the the prejudice, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think his actions are an extra little icing on the cake of showing how much he cares and how willing he is to do whatever uh, to to sort of make things right, uh, in, at least in her eyes. But I would I would argue that her genuine feelings come more from I like this guy and it turns out he's not a dick like I thought he was, <laughs> you right. know, and, and his actions help prove that. But I would say it's more her her turning point is more understanding that he didn't do the things she hated for the reasons that she thought. Yeah, I mean. What you're talking about, Alex, is a common difficulty in historical film, which is that if it's not modern or if it's not set in a world that we're familiar with, and I think we talked about this a little bit with The Devil Wears Prada, if it's set in an unfamiliar world, whether that's a time period or a culture or whatever it is, or even just like a very specific workplace, for example, Mm -hmm. if it's set in an unfamiliar world, One of the things that you absolutely have to do as quickly and clearly as you can as a screenwriter is define the value systems of that world. And the more removed it is from the world of your audience, the harder that is to do. Right. And so I feel like this is a really good example. Obviously, Jane Austen, when she wrote the source material here and wrote the novel, was writing to readers in her own world, who definitely would have immediately understood the value systems. So that becomes a huge challenge of the adaptation. We've discussed this many times in in terms of adaptation challenges. Novels are not the same, and there's a lot you have to pack in if you're going to adapt it into one feature film, and there's a lot you're going to have to cut. But one thing you can't cut is the value system building because otherwise there are no stakes for your characters. So like we, the audience, need to understand as quickly as we can. It happens to be the first scene of the novel. um, And it's the first scene of this movie where Mrs. Bennett is talking to Mr. Bennett. You know, another field 
Paul has been let. There is a very rich bachelor that is staying there. He must marry one of our daughters because he mm-hmm. must marry one of our daughters. It's it's a very, very smart place to open this movie. But then the movie takes great care. The screenplay takes great care to reinforce this value system throughout where the marriages of like she turns down Collins and that decision wouldn't feel like there were any stakes to it. If we didn't clearly understand if she turns down Collins, they could lose their home. Mm-hmm. Right. Because he's the inheritor of their home and their property. This is something that her mom is actively trying to orchestrate to save her daughters from financial ruin and hardship. And Elizabeth turns it down because of the way that she feels. Mrs. Bennett, you know, ends up being sort of the embodiment of the value system throughout. Right. But the movie does a great deal of work to keep all of that stuff in. And to me, one of the most poignant scenes where we see this is when Charlotte, uh, Elizabeth's friend, comes to tell her that she's marrying Collins. Mm -hmm. And that's where we really see it spelled out. It reminds me of that scene you were talking about, Brian, with Florence Pugh, with Amy in the the newest adaptation of Little Women. Exactly what I was thinking. Like a character sort of, like you said, not looking into the camera, but basically saying, this is why we have to make these choices. Because Mm -hmm. as you were saying, it is hard for us as a modern audience to know, well, why wouldn't they just do this? And and it is... Very helpful when a character says, I wish I could do those things. I can't. That is not the world that I live in. Maybe it's the world you live in. It's not the world I live in. Mm -hmm. It's very smart, obviously, to if there's sort of an unfamiliar world, you have this protagonist who their morals align more with ours as a modern audience, Mm -hmm. um, which is sort of them kind of ahead of their time going into the future, as opposed to if you have a bunch of normal characters and one of them goes and joins a cult and that's your protagonist. It's like, all right, you have to sell this cult to (laughs) me, but this is almost the opposite. It's someone, (laughs) it's someone living in this world of rules that feels alien to us, but they are saying we don't get these rules and they don't make sense to us. And then you have an ally in Donald Sutherland where it's like, oh, finally someone else who agrees as opposed to someone like Judy Dench's character, who is the other end of very like, much. Yeah. You cannot break from tradition and how dare you and, and things. But I just always appreciate any time a protagonist of a sort of alien world is, or it doesn't have to be the protagonist, any character who sort of feels like our way in to this strange world and helps us understand that it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but we're going to hang out here for a while and just bear with us. Speaking of Judy Dench, like my note that I took was, I just wrote in all caps, Dame Judy Dench. <laughs> <laughs> When, like, the camera reveals her, like, looking as, like, Dame Judy Dench as possible and just yeah. being, The like, size of her hair! Like, her <laughs> and all of her Judy Denchness. It was just so beautiful. And I was, like, it, like, reinvigorated me at that point in the movie. I was, like, oh, my God, I forgot. Like, yes. I feel like every movie should have surprise Judy Dench, like, <laughs> yes. 40 minutes in. Yes. It's, like, the opposite of surprise Matt Damon. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, the scene you were just talking about. Brian, where her her best friend comes back and it's like, I married Collins. Like, that's the world. That is really effective for all the reasons you were saying. And I also immediately had a flashback because she's like, you know what? Like, I'm 27. Like, this is like really good for me. <laughs> right. And I flashed back to the Butch Cassidy scene mm-hmm. where yeah. uh, she's <laughs> like, I'm 26. I'm single. I'm a school teacher. And that's the bottom of the pit. Yeah. And it's, like, it's, it's exactly <laughs> wow. the same thing. Like, you're right. like in your mid to late 20s, kind of, and you're not married. And that's the worst thing. And that's... <laughs> hilarious to me now and sad right. all, all historically yeah i yeah. do i do also like that the rules of this world are not hey i like you let's go on a date it's just let's all get engaged to each other just like we go from <laughs> like boy she's handsome to we're engaged right like, like, oh, like wow, we've fast. barely spoken right and like the next step is engagement which is just like that that's a, the rules of the world which also feel alien to us right but, yeah it's like that's how it happened <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I, I feel like that that was still like the barrier for me for entry is that like even understanding the rules of the world, it was still hard for me to like empathize and identify kind of like you were saying also, and especially in the second half, like, you know, things were happening and part of me was just like, well, it's a good thing that like these people are pretty and that like those people are rich because otherwise like you wouldn't be able to solve any of your problems. <laughs> But and so, I, but I think that's also why I wanted to like go and do more research and understand the context when it came out because I was I was feeling very much that it's like it's like not a 2020 movie. It's not a 2020 <laughs> movie. It ends like at the like ma- giant mansion, like just like right, you know, 
she everybody's gets, married. Like everybody's she gets, rich. She gets <laughs> the most money, like at the end, also right. in addition to the like true love. But and and again, and the very little bit of research I was able to do, I, it did help me understand that when this book came out, and of course, I'm sure you know this all, Trisha, obviously, but like that the the themes of individual happiness mattering whatsoever especially for women were radical like this was Mm. a radical book at the Mm. time and so i think really like understanding that deeply made me appreciate all of it so much more and so it still has a a happy ending for the time where everyone gets the thing that they want and need for society but in the meantime it's dealing with kind of crazy radical ideas of like maybe individual happiness is interesting and when is it right to put your happiness before familial obligation and kind of raising interesting questions that are still relevant in many ways today just to say this in words the reason why like so many films that would be described as like women's movies or chick flicks if we want to like throw that label on them especially in the historical genre, but even now, the reason why so many of those films are about romantic plot lines and romantic themes are not because women are more interested in romance than men are. It is because for a long time in human history, that was the only arena in which they had any sort of life. Mm -hmm. They were not allowed to have any sort of business plot lines. They were not allowed to have any sort of like adventures. They were not allowed to have anything like that. The only kind of plot lines that women were allowed to have in history were plot lines, quote unquote, of romance. And that is why we see women at the center of romantic stories, particularly in historical contexts. And if that's a barrier for entry for you... It is because you probably haven't read enough history. Right. I don't know what I mean, else to say. I mean, I mean, I agree. But then, you know, you also get some, uh, you also get Lizzie Borden and Joan of Arc. So, you know, there's all sorts of uh, plot lines. <laughs> <laughs> Things but went no, well yeah. for them. Everything went great for characters like <laughs> right. that in history. Right. <laughs> there's a great 30 Rock joke that's basically that also. Well, yeah. It, well, and I feel like it's the, it's the frustration of like that lesson and that context like there is ignorance to that because it's also not like shown to people. Like I feel like at no point in my life did I encounter a situation where that information would have been like shown to me. And that's also Mm -hmm. why it's frustrating and has continued. And so I think that's, I'm very happy that I've watched Pride and Prejudice now because it was a neat movie, but also because of this greater understanding that I, I feel like I have for this, uh, genre, I guess, but like movies of this time, stories of this time, understanding the cultural context, and that I think will help alleviate my barriers to entry. So instead of me just being like, oh, it's rich, pretty British people, like not having problems while the rest of the world is suffering, like understanding that within that there is intense human struggle and people maneuvering for yeah. equality and independence Absolutely. inside of that that story. Yeah, which which brings me to a to a question I wanted to ask because I was thinking about this. Um, I was thinking about things that get adapted a lot and why they get adapted a lot. Hmm. And so something like Romeo and Juliet, it's like you can tell that story in one sentence and and it feels visceral in the sense of two families hate each other, two of the kids fall in love. And because of the family's hate, it leads to their death. And it's like, oh, wow. OK, that's like a strong. It's like, what a great love story. It's like, no, it's not. But um, <laughs> uh, but it, it's a what it's, great hate story. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the director, when I was in it, said this is a, actually a hate story, not a love story. Yep. But it's such an easy thing to wrap your head around. Um, and then you have something like Pride and Prejudice, which has had multiple miniseries, multiple movies, Bridget Jones, obviously, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Like it's been sort of and, and I was reading like 200 different novels have been written by 50 different people that are sort of spin-offs that are set in yep. the in the PNP universe, the PNPU, you yes. know. Um, <laughs> the PPU. Um and uh so I was wondering and this is a question for anybody but mostly Patricia's who's you know has studied this more like I think Pride and Prejudice is not such a simple 
plot to wrap your head around. It's, well, there's this character, they live in this world, the world has certain rules, they're supposed to marry, but they actually like that. And I'm wondering, like, for something that's not quite as cut and dry and simple and something that was so ahead of its time for its time, but then mm-hmm. now when you make it, you have to sort of explain the rules of this different time. Of like, why do you think it is still to this day so adapted and so sort of has such staying power? I think the main reason is because it really is a novel and and a story of self-discovery and like self-work. Elizabeth and Darcy are only able to come together after they work on themselves and overcome their pride and prejudice. Like Mm. that is the thing is that they are having to question inside of themselves their own beliefs and their own value systems. Um, it's it's a sign of maturity that when Elizabeth, you know, she forms a very quick judgment and so does Darcy um, of who the other person is. Darcy happens to absolutely love her wit and her personality, but he is trapped by the value system of the world, the fact that she's in a different social standing, the fact that her family acts objectionably, you know, according to social mores and things like that. He has to examine in himself how important that is and and whether or not he's going to let it, you know, overcome his feelings if he's going to make the quote unquote right or rational decision in the eyes of the world or if he's going to make a difficult decision and face probably what are very real consequences from that. Um, right. And it's the same thing with Elizabeth. And I think that that is timeless. Humans are always journeying toward self-discovery and like self-actualization. We're sorting out our own priorities and value systems. Elizabeth has to um, realize how wrong she was. And that's always hard to admit. And I really love the proposal scene in the middle of this. It's mm-hmm. a midpoint. I, I wondered. I wanted to get Michael's take on it as a midpoint. Midpoint. But, hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I I love that it brings out those very real issues. Those are not. Um, they're not actually. They are influenced, and their identities have been constructed by the social context in which they live. And we see the value system and the social context in which they live. But the conflict comes from what they personally are going through and what they personally believe. There's interior life and work that's being done. And that scene that comes to a head during Darcy's first proposal brings both of those things to the surface. It's not just, well, he told me I can't be with you, so I guess I can't. Right. It's not that. It's like, I'm wrestling with this. And and Elizabeth has to admit what she's wrestling with. And that is timeless. And I do think that's a big part of the reason this continues to be adapted. The other reason, of course, is that anything that was revolutionary um, for women at the time, sadly, still feels revolutionary. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Just to say that also (sighs) in words. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I I had another just kind of more like fun question. uh, Yeah. Which I raised before the podcast of just like, so my experience seeing this once again back like it was I think it was first year of college and I still was in touch with my like all of my girlfriends from high school and this was like during Thanksgiving break and we all went to go see it and I was like stunned by like the overwhelming like teenage girl reaction to Mr. Darcy like <laughs> like I just wouldn't have like I would like watching like this character in this movie like I wouldn't have thought this was like the pinnacle of like I, take me, sir. Like this, like I want this man to take me. <laughs> right. So I was just, I just found it very fascinating. I'm like, like, why do we think that the character of Mr. Darcy is so is like such a thing? I want to hear from everybody on this, Michael. What do you think? <laughs> well, um, first of all, the midpoint I love because there's lots of rain, and anytime there's rain, it's working. So you want to. <laughs> Make I mean, it goes that. back to that like messiness that makes them feel like real yeah. people, right? When they're drenched and right, you know, like it's also down still and it's gorgeous. Literally... It's still right. like a gorgeous landscape and <laughs> very romantic, but it's got that realism mixed in. Rain just looks good on film. It does. I don't know that I can offer a super insightful answer. I feel like when she was like, "Oh, that's Mr. Darcy," and she gave him like eyes. I was like, "Wait, what? Like that's Mr. Darcy? Like him?" <laughs> mm-hmm. But I feel like that's often my reaction. I feel like I am also fascinated by the different mechanics that go into uh, 
attraction for people and how mm. how varied it can be where like some people can almost universally be like celebrated as you know a symbol of attraction and then other people are extremely polarizing um i just find that fascinating and it's because i have no answers to explain it and it's mostly puzzling um so i don't know but by the end i feel like i came around to darcy mostly just because he's like a more interesting person like i feel like in the same way that she's kind of like frustrated with societal life he's kind of like strikes me as frustrated but in his own super rich gonna collect sculptures from everywhere (laughs) kind of a way (laughs) so many sculptures right so like yeah if it's between him and the other guy yeah darcy (laughs) I'll I'll get back to that in a minute. Go ahead, Brad. Tell us what you love about Darcy. Look, I don't know because I spent most of my 20s as the sulking guy in the corner of parties who kind of insulted people sometimes and no one was infatuated with me. So I'm I'm lost. Uh, Yeah, Wrong era. (laughs) I think that a few things here with the Darcy archetype, I think that the thing that women are attracted to in the character, at least what I'm attracted to in the character, has to do with the fact that he... I don't know, it's probably corny to say, but like he sees Elizabeth and the ways that she upsets the value system. Yeah, doesn't adhere to her role in the way that she's necessarily supposed to. And and Darcy is attracted to that in her, Mm. I think is like kind of the dream, right? Where it's (laughs) like, if you could just have a guy that was like into the ways that you, um, I don't know, men tend to be threatened by women that don't stick in their roles. And so a man that is actually attracted to women, a woman who is not sticking in her social role is like a huge turn on because that's, that is just so rare to find um, rather than, you know, the typical response, which which is what we see from Collins in this, where he's like, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I assume that you just wish to be shy and delicate and you just wish to make, seem more eager, not seem too eager. (laughs) Young ladies, like, young ladies like it when I talk to them like this. Yeah. Um, (laughs) We have all been courted by that guy and there's, there's nothing less attractive than a dude telling you what he thinks you are like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When he doesn't Mm -hmm. know you. Um, So I, I think it's that at its heart, probably with the character of Darcy, sort of broadly speaking. Um, I think the screenwriting here is really smart because the ways that it differs from the book um, do humanize Darcy in some important ways. This is all present in the plot of the book, but the way that he talks to and, and talks with his sister is really important where he's obviously really um allowing her to grow into her own person so we see that there's he it's not only elizabeth that he like sees as this complete person he also sees other women that way so there's a consistency of character there that i think is really important um but also yeah he saves her family from financial ruin and social disgrace and does so anonymously right Mm -hmm. like there's Mm -hmm. some of these other things that the the film date and the book take great care to establish within his character that um, are just, they're just quote unquote traits that we all find virtuous or would like want to see from somebody. So even though he has some traits that are also difficult uh, or, or, you know, create, which actually on, honestly only create like sort of more mystery around him in a kind of appealing right. way. And but, I think in some way that's also maybe yeah. like, yeah, like the, the male brain versus the female mm-hmm. brain, like attraction mechanisms. Like, I think there's something <laughs> interesting because, you know, because like it was me and a bunch of women, but we're all like attracted physically to men. Right. But I was noticing there was like a different mechanism of attraction going on where it's like my male brain was not putting together all the complexities that you just laid out. Whereas like, I feel like their brains were like doing a more complex algorithm of like, this equals yes, Mr. Darcy. Yes. Well, and it probably, (laughs) and it probably has to do with all of the stuff that we've been talking about, which is that I wish this movie felt a little bit further removed from me than it, as it does to you. 
it doesn't mm. feel that far removed to me, actually. In right. Terms the, of the, the, the algorithms the that, that have to be done are still having to be done. They're right. a lot <laughs> fewer for me. It's yeah. not such a leap to imagine <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that the world would be like this for me. Um, right. And, you know, even even in your situation, Alex, there's a, a difference there in terms of like the pressures that are on uh, the different characters. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. No, that all the things you just laid out, like answer my question, like 100 percent. Really <laughs> great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. You're very welcome. <laughs> I understand now the Mr. Darcy phenomenon. I mean, although Matthew McFadden is a dreamboat, like he's a dreamy dreamboat and they shot him like it when he's walking over the thing the in the dawn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the music there is so like <laughs> epic. <laughs> I want to go in and add like a lightsaber turning on because yes. I feel like yes. he looks like a Jedi, like emerging from the fog. Seriously. Right. His, his like cape billowing. Yeah. Yeah. And and shout out to the costume designer there whose name I have written down somewhere, but she does a lot of the heavy lifting in Darcy's character to to make him more and more approachable, right? Where he's so buttoned up. Mm -hmm. And 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 of course it's in Matthew McFadden's performance as well. And also he's like six three or four or something, which seemed very tall. Very tall. (laughs) But but he is so um stiff and carries himself more aloofly at the beginning. And then there's this breaking down and breaking down of it. Um, down to that final scene where his whole costume is totally different. Um, he's like in his pajamas essentially, with a coat, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's smart design in addition to smart writing Mm -hmm. guys i'm upset i really want to rewatch lord of the rings but ever since we set this patreon goal where once we hit 500 patrons we'll do three lord of the rings episodes and a patreon exclusive episode on the hobbit i decided i should wait and hold off until we hit our goal so i need your help listener we're about three quarters of the way there which means we're tiptoeing past the black gate and making our way to the secret stairs of Carathungal. so it's up to you to help us fight off the big freaking spider make our way through a sea of orcs do a little dance with Gollum, and drop this thing in the fires of mount doom once and for all i knew what every term he just said meant i saw your <laughs> face light up it was so adorable <laughs> <laughs> i want to watch the movie now I'm speechless and I'm with you. I want to watch these movies so badly. Please hurry up, Patreon. We if need I this. don't rewatch these movies, I really won't have any idea what any of that meant. Why didn't the birds just fly them there? <laughs> <laughs> They're eagles. I can't wait to talk to you guys about that on this podcast. Eagles are birds. <laughs> they do what they want. Why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take away from Pride and Prejudice? Brian, do you want to start us off? It's a weird one because you wouldn't think of it with this movie, uh, but just tracking several characters over the course of of a movie when almost none of them is a main character. Uh, So, you know, you have plenty of movies that are more like about an ensemble movie or something like that. But this movie is about basically four people, four ish people. Mm -hmm. But you have what, 20 some people to keep track of over the course of it. And I personally am not have not written a lot with many, many characters. I've like the most I've written is like maybe like five in a scene. But in this movie, it's like there's rarely fewer than four people in a scene at any given time because there's five daughters and two parents. And then the, you know, Mr. Darcy and uh, B- Bigsley. What's his name? B- Bingsley. Bingley. Bingley. Thank you. And, and I just think it's it's cool to watch two different parts of it, one of which several characters in one scene where you are sort of tracking who's talking to whom and like what they're talking about and who cares about what and who's excited about this and who's upset about it and that kind of thing. But then also tracking them over the course of the movie. So the the characters I think of are Jenna Maloney and uh, Carrie Mulligan's characters who are or even Mary, like the uh, the the goth daughter, you know, the one that I, I identify with. Mary, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, where it's like they have so little to do in the movie and you only see them maybe once every 20 some minutes. But every time you see them, you remember who they yep. are and uh, and sort of what their relationship is and what they care about and all that kind of thing. So I just think it's a movie I'll come back to anytime I'm trying to. It's almost like I want to like make a spreadsheet, like who is in this scene? Who says what? When did they say it? Mm -hmm. What is their sort of interest in what's going on? And uh, and yeah, I just uh, I just am fascinated anytime I see that many characters being handled just because it's not something that I've done very much. Yeah. And actually, your lesson is kind of related to mine, Brian, which is that I was talking about value systems earlier. I think it's important to note something this movie does really well which is that just because you are trying as a screenwriter to est- to establish a value system 
does not mean that every single person who lives according to the value system has the same personality. Right. Definitely. Um, mm, yeah. Which, so you have somebody like Caroline Bingley, who is, you know, very wealthy, has all of the status, has everything, has a completely different personality than someone like Mary Bennett. Right. Mm -hmm. You couldn't pick two more different women. And yet they're still bound within this value system where we see different opportunities for them to potentially break away from it or challenge it. And yet they don't. But for totally different reasons, because they are different people. Yeah. And so like the scene where Mary is playing the piano at the ball and then her dad comes and like shuts her down and it's really moving and sad because the value system of the world is kind of crushing her, but for a different reason than it's restricting and, and hindering other people from pursuing their goals within the world. And so I, and I love to the moment, every moment with Mary is like really beautiful, but also really sad. Yeah, Like the, right. the moment where um, uh, Elizabeth turns down Collins and then like she busts out the door and, and all of her sisters are standing out there and the camera turns to Mary and kind of stays on her a minute longer. And you can see that like Collins is the person she's in love with. Right. Like mm. they, they, she and Collins would be a perfect match. And we see that and, and we know that and Mary knows that. But the rules of the world prevent that from ever happening. And, and as I pointed out earlier, Charlotte is another amazing example of that where she is adhering to to the value system and the rules of the world, but for completely different reasons because she's a different character. So when you're building out a value system, if you have every single character in your periphery saying the same thing, just like as a refrain of like, you mm. have to marry well because that's what we do in the same way, that's not what it is to build a value system. A believable right. value system is still dynamic and still nuanced. And it's not what it is to build a character. And supporting characters are the way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It was impressive tracking all of that and how everyone, like you were saying, Brian, there were so many people and also they all live in the system, but all have very different relationships to it while still living within those boundaries. Pretty early on, I also googled because i was watching and i was like okay wait who is that and that's so she's the sister of who now and mm -hmm. so i googled did you get a chart but i got it i immediately got a character <laughs> genealogy chart and i was nice. like you know what no this is too i don't think this is gonna help i'm just gonna watch the movie and it was fine but it was just funny because it was like oh wow there's like a lot going on and this matters a lot yeah. People who can follow every single character who ever was in the background shot of an episode of Game of Thrones and who they are and what they want, and they claim they right. can't do it for like a period romance movie, I call BS. <laughs> for right. sure. No, that was immediately like, because the only th other thing I've seen that has genealogies is Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, this you is can not do as it. complicated. I yeah. believe in you, <laughs> <laughs> viewers. <laughs> but where are the dragons? Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, lesson. It kind of goes off of what we said before about just how Joe Wright goes above and beyond with the way he yeah. shoots this film. And, oh, yeah. you know, beyond the fact that he, he has these really uh, wonderful long takes that, that actually do enhance the scenes. They're not just there to show off how they can pull off a one but they're actually immersing you in a party or, yeah. you know, giving you kind of a snapshot of like 10 different characters across this party as we kind of pass by them. Mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of information being portrayed in these long takes. And the blocking is like amazing. I think there's like a, there's a dance happening with the camera and the mm -hmm. actors yep. that is just so exquisitely blocked out. Um, you just don't see that very often where it just feels like the dance is just it, all the beats are landing and it just feels effortless and lovely. So, yeah, I, I think once again, like we were saying, you could have shot this movie very conventionally, uh, just a lot of shot reverse shot dialogue scenes. Um, but the fact that he chose to to really immerse us in this world with you know, a much more difficult approach to doing the, all the timing of all these little character moments happening right at the right time in the right place and having an uninterrupted camera move like that's very difficult. And so I, I love them for embracing the difficulty of that to give us a more special film. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think for me, it's the, again, going back to being really impressed by the witty dialogue and the way the characters express themselves. Yeah, appreciating how much of that was came from the book also. I think it helped me appreciate this film because surface level plot stuff I wasn't necessarily deeply involved with. But 
underneath all of that, the characters' inner lives and what was being revealed about them was really interesting. And it's Mm -hmm. kind of a lesson I feel like we've talked about before, where what's happening on the surface doesn't always matter. It's what it's doing to the characters and how the characters are interacting that can draw people in and have an emotional effect. And I also kind of realized that there's, it's like a, a forced subtext situation because of all the politeness yeah. and the yeah. manners and things where it's like so much subtext mm. like no one can say no, directly they what they want or what they think right and so there's just all these clever ways of like being as polite as possible to dame judy dench while also saying not nice things to her at the same time right mm-hmm. um that i can't say on the podcast so uh <laughs> yeah I, I was just struck by that and i think it's it's a cool yeah, idea of creating constraints and and kind of, you know, another opportunity if you're building this value system. It's, it's, it's interesting that part of what comes with that value system are these boundaries where people can't say what they want or what they think. And so what other storytelling um, challenges and opportunities does that afford exactly. you as a storyteller? And just really quickly, because we haven't talked about her. You could just cast Kira Knightley. <laughs> I don't know. Right. She's she's so yeah. amazing in this film where like yeah. half of the work that she does, she's not even speaking. Yeah. It's right. just sort of how she moves her head and her face and um right. the inner life that you're talking about is clearly so rich. Um mm-hmm. and, and just well understood and acted by her in this. And and so her her Oscar nomination for this is very deserved. She's she's wonderful in it. Yeah, she she's so good at being able to switch from like cute and like childish to just very graceful and poised at the at the same time and like as the same character in the same movie and i think that's really impressive because usually you cast someone because they're good at being one or the other um Mm -hmm. and then you have rosamund pike who i'm just i just makes me nervous now after gone girl i'm like don't marry her (laughs) (laughs) she's so sweet in this movie though no she's amazing i love her she's awesome yeah. yeah she's great yeah, whole cast. It, that was also funny having not seen it then, Carrie and then going Mulligan. back and like, right? Ev- yeah. Like everybody is in it. this. Yeah, like yeah. literally everyone. <laughs> Great. Why don't we go around and say what we've been watching recently? Trisha, what have you been watching recently? I will be as quick as I can. So I saw this movie Emma, not E M M A, like the new version of Emma, which I've already talked about, but E M A, which is from 2019. It's a film by Pablo Larraín is how I'm going to say the last name. He's a Chilean filmmaker um, starring Mariana Di Girolamo and Gail Garcia Bernal. And GGB. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> the hottest man ever. Um, it's a fantastic, and by that I mean literally like fantastical kind mm. of dance art movie, but it's also sort of this dark family drama about an adoption that's gone wrong there's this couple um and they're both heavily involved with this like modern dance company and they had adopted like a troubled youth and um by the beginning of the movie they've like returned him essentially into the foster care system because it it didn't work out but there's this whole backstory but they're expressing a lot of it through dance Mm. like Gail Garcia Bernal's character is kind of the choreographer of the dance company I thought of you so much when I was watching it Alex I was like Alex would love this movie um and it's it's gorgeous all of the dance in it is is gorgeous and and wonderful and it's just like cool music it's a very specific kind of music that I'm not going to attempt to describe that is like sort of uniquely born out of this like culture and place um I was interested in it though because the director Pablo Larraín is also the director of the upcoming um, Bad Robot Apple TV collaboration series on Lisey's Story, which is one of my favorite Stephen King books that I think I've mentioned Mm. before. Um, So this same director is doing that adaptation of that book into an Apple TV series. I mean, knock wood, who knows now with anything that's in production. But essentially, I mean, but it's set to star Joan Allen, Clive Owen, and Julianne Moore. So it's probably going to be fine. Um, And and I really love Children of Men too. (laughs) Yeah. And Stephen King wrote all the episodes of the miniseries too. So um, just really, really excited about that. Emma from 2019, if you love psychedelic dance, dark dance movies. (laughs) Sounds good. I like that these are like, specific niche corner basically right. with Trisha every time. It's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Now she's going to go watch Dancer in the Dark with Bjork. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Alex, what have you been watching? 
I've been rewatching the Netflix German series Dark, which I can't stop talking about and bugging, not. bugging these guys about <laughs> because I'm obsessed with it. Uh, I've been rewatching it because season three uh, will be out by the time this podcast is out. Um, it's the third and final season of the show. Um, and from what I understand, it's basically all been mapped out uh, since pretty early in the show's inception. So it's, you know, this one, it's a, it's a really cool experiment in like, you know, knowing where your show ends from the beginning and just executing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm really excited to see what they have in store for the ending. Um, so anyway, yeah, if you are a fan of sci-fi, a fan of time travel stories, uh, you got to check out Dark. And I finally made Michael watch at least the first episode. I watched the first two episodes last night and I was like, OK, yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, good. <laughs> I was like, I was telling Michael, I was going to have like kind of like a crisis if he like hated it or something, because I feel like it's like such an overlap of our interest. There's like crime drama involved. There's like, like really hard sci fi, like all these overlapping things. And so if he hated that, he'd be like, wait, what are we like? What's our collaboration anymore? If you hate this, <laughs> it is really you guys fascinating. You don't need to go to therapy now. Right, exactly. <laughs> It is really interesting. It also really feels like German Stranger Things. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just really fun. Yeah. And <laughs> to, to see that happening. Brian, what are you watching? I've uh, I've been rewatching Freaks and Geeks. Nice. Uh, which, yeah, which I love so much and haven't mm -hmm. rewatched in maybe close to 10 years at this point. Uh, I think it's my third time watching through it. And um, I just, I love it so much. I think it's aged very well. It sort of commits to this realism with sort of actors who aren't always the best actors and stuff and it makes for the sort of awkward feeling but in this very real way that just makes me feel like i'm watching almost a documentary in in this bizarre way where it's just like mm -hmm. it's like we are not doing the sort of actory thing here we are doing the just whatever our kind of actor like child actor reaction to this moment is and stuff and I also just think the construction of each episode is really beautiful. Like I was just struck by how every single episode feels like this complete story with like a heartbreaking crisis moment and just like these these sort of themes that just really hurt to sort of watch these characters go through. And usually the the Sam and Lindsay story, the sort of protagonist brother and sister are tied together in some way where mm -hmm. they're kind of both dealing with a similar take on a theme and then it comes together a little bit, but it's usually not too much together. It's kind of their own, they're on their own journeys and stuff. And, uh, and yeah, I just think it's a really impressive show and it's like, I'm actually, we're like, my girlfriend and I are kind of watching it slowly because we don't want it to be over. <laughs> like, yeah. I just feel like once it's over, we'll just start it again <laughs> because it's just such a great thing to put on when we're like, ah, maybe not a movie tonight, but like, let's just like chill and watch something yeah. that is very familiar and f sort of feels like home to us in a, in a weird way. Totally. So I recently watched a Netflix uh, comedy special um, called Mike Birbiglia, the new one. <gasps> Yay! Oh, I, I love, love Mike it Birbiglia. so much. Oh, good. My girlfriend had seen his live show uh, in LA and sort of just went to see it randomly and then came back and was like, it's amazing. Yeah. I laughed. I cried. You have to watch it. And then when she saw it was on Netflix. And so finally it was like, I hey, sat down and like, all right, let's give this a try. I'll do it. And I laughed and I cried. And it's just, <laughs> it's such a really, this kind of new sort of comedy special that I've been seeing more lately where it's like, it's half comedy stand up jokes, but half like, really vulnerable and storytelling revealing yeah storytelling mm -hmm. um and so yeah it's it's the comedian mike perbiglia um and it's the show that he had on broadway and it's sort of like recounting this complicated emotional journey toward parenthood mm -hmm. uh and it's just it goes to all the places and is delightful and heart-wrenching and all the things so uh highly recommend it was it was very good i was I, very glad that I watched it. So Mike Birbiglia, the new one. It actually, it's a great thing to watch if you're in a dark place. It'll make you feel mm. better for sure. Mm. I kept wanting to say Mike Imbruglia. Nope. That's, <laughs> no, it's different. And then that makes me want to sing the song. Right. You were, you were torn between which way to pronounce it. No. Right. <laughs> Nothing's right. I'm torn. <laughs> Great, everybody. This has been our conversation on Pride and Prejudice. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, as always, to the patrons for making this show possible. And we will see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.